Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle, aka Stitcherista here on YouTube, and today is Friday, March 1st. So happy Friday and happy birthday to my friend Becky. I hope she has a really good day today. So my work schedule, it's unpredictable every week. I mean, we may have jobs on the schedule, but things cancel, things change. So I actually had off yesterday and I had off today. Yesterday, Bill was home doing a class for work via Zoom, so he was downstairs all day, and I just relaxed, did some reading, I did a lot of diamond painting. You will see once I, well, you can see right now, what am I saying? I finished like a whole complete row, so I am now on the next row of this diamond painting, and yes, I got a lot done. This is also going to be my update video for the week because I didn't do any stitching. I haven't really had the stitching bug and I've just given myself grace to just do what I want as far as crafts and diamond painting has been it. So yes, I did a bunch of diamond painting yesterday. I haven't really been watching. I did watch a good movie yesterday and I say that I say I haven't been watching things, but I did. So this was a movie starring Alex Kendrick, who does Christian-based movies like War Room. And they did Facing the Giants. I don't know if they did War Room. I feel like they had a part in it. But this was a movie called Overcomer. Such a good movie and a good message. And even a song at the end I found on YouTube to put on my playlist I almost wrote him. I went, I went online to try to find information to write him. Such an amazing message. Loved that movie so much. So I watched that while I diamond painted yesterday. I haven't been watching anything really at night because what I've been doing is I've been prioritizing sleep and rest. So when Bill goes to bed, I've been going to bed because by the time I wash my face, brush my teeth, get into pajamas, do all that, it's like 8.30-ish, so I've been getting into bed. Now, what I've been doing is I will put on a motivational speech on YouTube and just have my phone play. And the ones I've been listening to are by Eddie Pinero, and I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he is a motivational speaker. And the two videos I've listened to this week are like three hours each. Now... One I listened to yesterday, some of the things really hit home, and I will link the video down below. It is called Determined. And, you know, I'm always trying to be a better person. You know, I'm in like weight loss mode, trying to be healthy in that regard, but also trying to be healthy in my brain, in my ways I do things. And he said, one of the things that he said in this video yesterday that really caught my attention was you have to start showing up for yourself, right? And what he means by that is like, that's going to be different for everybody. But he was saying it like when you don't feel like doing something that you know is going to be good for you in the long run, you have to show up for yourself. So today... Showing up for myself meant doing a 10-minute yoga video because I've been wanting to incorporate like yoga or stretching or something into my daily routine because I think it will be hugely beneficial to me. And trust me, the video I did, I did a 10-minute standing yoga stretch, yoga with Juliana. I was shaking on some of the poses and it was only 10 minutes. So I look forward to doing that one every day at least until I can get through it without shaking or, you know, feeling tension. But when I do something like that, it carries over in a good way into the rest of my day. I make better food choices, different things like that. So, but yeah, showing up for yourself means, for me, doing yoga. Not spending money I don't need to spend on things that I don't need to purchase. Prioritizing sleep. Being good to myself. 
you have to show up for yourself. And that when and when it hit it, and I was like kind of dozing off. And when he said that, it woke me up because, you know, all of the bad habits that I've had over these years, that's not showing up for myself. It isn't. So I encourage you to listen to his video. And also, and I'm trying to remember exactly how he said it, because showing up for yourself, as far as like healthy eating for me, it means no junk. And it's not like, he said, if you leave the door cracked, eventually it will be kicked open. Meaning like, let's say I said to myself, okay, I'm going to at a birthday party, have a piece of cake and not feel guilty about it. No. Those are things where I go to a birthday party. There's no rule that says you have to have cake or eat something junky. You don't have to do it. So I know I will feel better if I don't have that cake. And do I feel deprived? No, because that's a mindset switch also. You know how much dessert I've eaten in my almost 50 years? I'm good. And there are other alternatives like an apple with peanut butter. I don't need to have cake. Don't need to have it. I also am not drinking alcohol anymore. I haven't had alcohol since the beginning of December and I don't miss it. So, and I feel like now when I'm in those positions and people are going to be like, oh, why aren't you drinking? Oh, why aren't you having a piece of cake? Because I'm showing up for myself. <laughs> because for me, if I have that piece of cake, it will be breaking down that door of junk. That's how Bill and I got off track before. We went to, for me, I can pinpoint it. We went to a cookout and I had been doing really well. And I had some alcohol, which for me and for probably most people definitely will lower your inhibitions and your rational decision making, right? So I had had a couple drinks and was feeling pretty good. And then it was time to eat. And I was like, fuck it. I'm going to have a burger with a bun, which is not what I usually did. I would usually just have the burger. And it was just like a slippery slope, kicking the door down. It's, he, the way he worded it really, really hit home with me. So I encourage you, start showing up for yourself. And that means also not letting people walk all over you. Or maybe lowering your stress level if you can. There, I'm a control kind of person. Like, I want to know what's going on. I want to be in control of it. It has been a journey so far this year of me really just letting things go. And in my work, in my career, as what I do as a scopist, it really has come to pass because my boss and I are two completely different people excuse me, two completely different people on how we work and handle tasks. And it has been a huge learning lesson for me in letting go, in letting it go. I'm only one person. I do the absolute best job I can and do the duties I can, but you can't make someone else come to your level and do the things that you the way that you do them. So showing up for myself in that regard is not being stressed about work, is not being upset about things that don't get done in the timeline that I think they should get done. Right? Yeah. But the main things for me, as far as showing up for myself, not overeating or eating, making poor food choices, and not overspending, prioritizing sleep, getting proper rest, and exercising as of right now. So those things could change on a daily basis, but I think you know in your mind when you are doing something that you're showing up for yourself. So one of the things too was that I needed to find a new skincare routine. 
So I'm going to be 50 in May and I've always had dry skin. And I am a very basic skin person, meaning I don't want some complicated 15-step regimen. First of all, I don't want to spend the money on all of those products. And I don't want to be in the bathroom in the evening or in the morning for 45 minutes doing skincare. I am willing to age gracefully, but still want to have the best skin that I can going forward. I'm not really a sun worshiper. I don't go in the sun. I wear a CC cream that has sunscreen in it. So at least I've done that step for quite a while now. I watched a bunch of YouTube videos on women who are my age and what they do. And you have to be able to weed out just the things that aren't going to apply to you. So I wound up finding three products and I ordered them on Amazon. They will be here tomorrow. And also, I was very productive today. Also, we needed a new pizza pan. We have had our pizza pan. It's been a really, really long time. And Bill said to me the other day, we really need to get a new pizza pan. So I told him this morning, I said, I'm going to look on Amazon and see if I can find one. And I did. So ordered that. That's also going to be here tomorrow. So I talk to Bill every morning on the phone. And when I talk to him... This morning, he was like, what can we do tomorrow? He said, it's supposed to be raining. And I'm, So we sat there for a couple minutes, and we could not think of anything besides the normal, you know, watching TV, playing board games, which we've done that. I said, well, I do have a massage in the morning. So I have a massage at 9 o'clock, which I usually get home from that about 1030. Then I get in the shower, so I'm not even ready to do anything until about 1130. So... I said, he goes, let's just put on our thinking caps. Okay. And I said, you know, I'm really going to try to find something that we can do. So I decided to go on Facebook. And if you click on the events tab, you can search for events in your area. And that's what I did. I searched for events that were happening tomorrow. One of the things that is happening tomorrow is there is a Maryland Home and Garden Show at the Timonium Fairgrounds. It's about a 40 minute ride for us. Great. Tickets were $10 a piece because Bill and I are going to have a vegetable garden this year. You know, one of his Christmas presents was box planters. And that's something that him and I are going to do together. I told him I would do that with him. I am looking forward to spending that time with him being outside and all of those kind of things. And then having vegetables that we'll be able to eat. So, I said, that sounds like something we could really do because it's until eight o'clock so we can get there when we want to get there. So I called him at work and I said, how's this sound? He was like, that sounds really good. So that's what we're doing tomorrow. So I'm excited that I was able to find something that him and I can do. And it's also a craft show. So there will be a whole bunch of stuff there that we can probably look at. So very excited to do that tomorrow, actually doing something. So someone had asked me about the rings I wear on my right hand, because obviously on my left hand, it's my engagement ring, my wedding band. That's all I wear on my left hand. On my right hand, I wear three rings. I wear a ring on my thumb that is a snake. I wear a ring on my middle finger that is a fox, and it looks like... His, it's the fox's head, and then the band that wraps around is the fox's tail. And then on my third finger is a ring that Bill got me for Christmas two years ago, and it's called a hug ring. It actually is two hands enveloping my finger. I'm supposed to be able to look at that and know that he's giving me a hug. All of those rings are adjustable, so you can squeeze them together to fit your fingers however you need to. I love the rings. They None of them were expensive. The snake ring Bill got me this Christmas. I had had it on my Amazon wish list. So I will link all of them down below because all of these were gotten on Amazon or were bought on Amazon. So to answer that person's question. Okay. So I thought I would 15 minutes in, but I knew I had some stuff that I wanted to talk to you guys about. 
And I am going to go ahead and read two true crime stories right now. And then that will be it. So that should probably take us to maybe 45 minutes for this video, which is not bad. Okay, so this one is Teresa Petto. The year was 2007, and Teresa Petto was attending her high school reunion. Kill me now. We have not been to one high school reunion. Was attending her high school reunion in Kalamazoo, Michigan. The evening had been a chastening one. Chastening? Chastening, chastening one for the recently divorced mother of two. All of her old school friends seem to have moved on to better things, to careers and happy marriages. So it, they, I think the wording there, it should have been sobering because it probably really just hit home that her life hasn't turned out how she had anticipated. Teresa, meanwhile, was washed up at 35, afflicted by rheumatoid arthritis living off disability checks and child support. The disparity left her feeling depressed and decidedly inadequate. She was ready to skulk off into the night when she ran into Brent Kick. Brent had been a classmate of Teresa's back in the day. He and Teresa had been on friendly terms back then, although there was nothing more to it than that. They had certainly never dated. Now, though, he was a sight for sore eyes, handsome and athletic, looking dapper in his expensive Italian suit. He told her that he was a VP for a printing company making decent bank, living the good life, still single. That last snippet was of particular interest to Teresa. When Brent asked if she wanted to join him for a nightcap after the party, she almost tripped over her tongue saying yes. That was how it began. The pair started seeing each other with Brent sometimes staying the night, but never giving any hint that he wanted to take their relationship further. Then in 2010, now what year was that? Okay, that was in 2000, that was three years later. Then in 2010, something happened that changed everything. Teresa was pregnant. Mm. Thereafter, she started pressuring Brent to live up to his responsibilities. Those calls became ever more strident after the birth of the couple's daughter in June of 2011. Teresa wanted them to move in together to be a family. Brent wasn't keen on the idea. He was happy to pay child support and to be involved in raising his daughter. What he didn't want was a wife and kids. This would end up becoming a major bone of contention between the pair. There were frequent fights, often getting so heated that Teresa threw Brent out, telling him never to return, but Brent always came back. He wasn't sure how he felt about Teresa anymore, but he was determined to be there for his daughter. And then on June 4th, 2015, there was a tragic turn of events. That was the day that Teresa Petto called 911 and told the dispatcher that her baby wasn't breathing and was turning blue in the face. Paramedics rushed to the scene but were unable to resuscitate the infant. She was declared dead at the scene. A post-mortem examination found that the child had suffered a skull fracture. Oh my. Although Teresa vehemently denied causing the injury, the baby's death was ultimately attributed to sudden infant death, death syndrome. Okay, and the only reason, I normally avoid stories like this because I don't like to read about children passing away. But because that's not the focus of this story, I kind of read ahead and saw that, so that's why I still read it. In the aftermath of this tragedy, Teresa descended into a deep depression. She suffered severe mood swings, weepy one moment, manic and aggressive the next. She became increasingly dependent on Brent for emotional support. At a time when he was trying to come to terms with the death of his daughter, Teresa was clinging to him, pressuring him to make their relationship more permanent. In the end, she only succeeded in driving him away. Shortly after the death of their child, he told her that it was over. Anyone who has ever been in love has experienced the agony of a broken heart. It hurts like hell, but eventually you pick yourself up, dust yourself off, move on. Years later, you probably look back and chuckle at your foolishness. You may even realize that the breakup was the best thing that could have happened to you. But Teresa Petto was not like most people. Teresa had a vindictive streak a mile wide. 
To friends, she ranted and raved about the man who had abandoned her in, abandoned her in the depths of her despair, who had walked away when she needed him most. Those rants would reach a crescendo when she heard that Brent was dating someone else. Oh, boy. Brent's new love interest was a work colleague named Rachel Drafta. At 25, Rachel was 18 years younger than Teresa. That's not going to sit well. She was also beautiful, well-educated, refined. None of this went down well with Teresa. Her rage had now shifted. No longer was it directed at Brent. It was focused entirely on his new love. She ranted constantly about the woman who had stolen her life, taken her man, who was living in her house, sleeping in her bed. This, even though she and Brent had never cohabitated. So she's living under a delusion of some sorts also. To Teresa's friends, the solution to her problem was obvious. Brent had moved on. She needed to do the same. But Teresa wasn't backing down. If anything, she was upping her game. She began stalking her ex, driving past his house at all hours of the day and night. She started keeping a journal, obsessively tracking Brent and Rachel's movements. More worryingly, she began assembling what can only be described as an abduction kit. This included duct tape, cable ties, rubber gloves, a machete, a revolver, and lots of ammo. Slowly, over the weeks that followed, she began crafting her journal entries into a list, a to-do list for a murder. Mm, okay. June 24th, 2015 marked a sad anniversary. It was four years exactly from the day that Teresa Petto's daughter died. It was also the day that Teresa had decided to put her plan into action, the plan that she believed would win back her former lover. Early that morning, Teresa got into her car and drove to the Portage, Michigan neighborhood where her nemesis, Rachel Drafta, lived with her parents. Parking her vehicle a couple of blocks away, she proceeded on foot to Rachel Street. There she waited in the shadows until Rachel emerged from her house just after 7.20. Teresa had played out this scenario many times in her head. In her imagination, the abduction went something like this. She broke cover as Rachel was walking to her car. She threatened Rachel with the gun and forced her into the vehicle. There she gagged her with duct tape and bound her hands with cable ties. Rachel would then be driven to a remote location and killed, her body hidden. Nobody would ever find her. It was, in Teresa's fevered brain, the perfect murder except that it didn't work out that way. Rachel was not intimidated by the gun. Rather than submit, she took out her cell phone and dialed Brent. That woman's here was all she got to say before Teresa fired, hitting her in the chest. Brent heard the shots and the shouting, but couldn't make out what was happening. Neighbors, meanwhile, were dialing 911. A police cruiser was patrolling just a few blocks away and diverted to the address. The officer found Teresa Petto walking calmly down the road and arrested her. 200 yards away, Rachel Drafto was bleeding out in her driveway. Despite the swift response of paramedics, she would not make it. She died in the hospital two days later. This was probably one of the easiest murder cases that Kalamazoo County prosecutors ever had to make. Not only was Teresa Petto arrested with the murder weapon in her hand, but she was carrying a backpack that contained several rounds of 22 caliber ammunition, zip ties, rubber gloves, trash bags, and mace. There was also her journal containing her detailed point-by-point -point plan for the abduction and murder of her love rival, Rachel. That said Drafto. That wasn't her name. It was Drafta. Faced with the overwhelming evidence against her, Teresa Petto had little option but to plead guilty at her September 2016 trial. She did, however, cite mitigating circumstances, claiming that she was mentally impaired at the time of the shooting. You would have to be. To do something like that, You are not, there's no way you were in your right mind. This was ultimately rejected by the court. Petto was sentenced to life in prison. She is currently held at the Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti. I hope I pronounced that right. 
She will never be released. And I don't understand how she thought that killing her was going to um, get her, get the guy back, get Brent back. I don't, how? No, no. Okay, so our next and last story, and this video will not be 45 minutes because it's not going to take me 20 minutes to read this. This is Gun Brit Ashfield. That's an interesting name. Okay. The small town of Nowra, N-O-W-R-A, Nowra, I don't even know if I pronounced that correctly. Someone will correct me, I'm sure, down below. It is a peaceful enclave situated on Australia's east coast. Located in an area of considerable natural beauty, it is a popular weekend destination for city dwellers traveling down from Sydney to enjoy the beautiful beaches, fine restaurants, and excellent local wineries. The area is also a haven for retirees seeking to escape the hustle and bustle of city life. Brian and Gun Britt Ashfield. That is such a unique name. I've never heard something like that. They were a long way from retirement age. They were, however, enjoying a life of relative leisure, living in government housing and subsisting on Social Security benefits. The pair were heavy drinkers and smokers, and Brian had a history of drug abuse. Their other main interest appears to have been procreation. Still in their mid-20s, they had five children ages between three and eight years. Wow, that has to be challenging. That, as you might imagine, made for a rowdy household, something that Brian took in his stride, but Gun Brit seemed to resent. She was frequently violent with her children, beating them mercilessly for the slightest infraction. No. It was this penchant for child abuse that would ultimately drive the couple apart. In 1993, after yet another argument over Gun Brit's treatment of the kids, Brian walked out. An uncontested divorce soon made the separation official with Brian's pleas for custody ignored by the court. He had a conviction. Wait a minute. Okay, I can't read the rest of this. It's about the kids. Nope, nope, not reading it. We are going to, I'm going to, Okay, we're going to read this next one. I'm sorry about that. I cannot finish that one. All right, so this one is Patricia Tito. Patricia Tito was a familiar sight in the bars and juke joints of Shreveport and Bossier City, Louisiana. A somewhat jaded blonde now pushing on into her late 30s, she still knew how to work a room and work it she did. She had a well-honed routine that usually involved zeroing in on any man who looked like he had a well-stocked wallet. And how can you tell that exactly? I guess someone who's dressed nicely? I don't know. The mark would be flattered and flirted into submission and would usually end up taking Patricia home. She would then take up residence in his life, cadging and cajoling as much cash as she could before moving on to the next sucker. It wasn't prostitution exactly, but it was close. The problem with Patricia's line of work was that her income was unpredictable. There were times of plenty and fallow periods during which she struggled to get by. At these times, she'd be forced to get a job and being unqualified to do anything else that usually meant waiting tables. This line of work was not without its benefits, though. There were plenty of male customers and Patricia flirted shamelessly with every one of them. This typically got her a few extra bucks and tips but every once in a while, Patricia hit the jackpot. Like the day that 47-year-old Chris Shufflin walked into the diner where she was working. Chris was a self-made man, a shrewd dealmaker in the oil industry. He worked for himself and he was good at what he did. Patricia noticed that right away by the way he dressed and by the thickness of his money clip as he peeled off some bills to pay for his meal. Before he left, she slipped him her phone number, and later that day, he called. Meeting Chris wasn't just hitting the jackpot for Patricia, it was finding the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Her new beau was a big-hearted man, and she tapped his generosity to the hilt. Almost daily, 
there were requests for cash and invariably these were met. In exchange, Chris got an experienced and adventurous lover willing to indulge his every fantasy. It was an arrangement that held for a year until disaster struck. Chris suffered a stroke. Oh, that's awful. During the first few days of Chris's hospitalization, Patricia was a constant companion at his bedside, tearfully exhorting him to fight to get better. But as Chris began to show signs of recovery, her emphasis changed. Now she was back to flirting and cajoling. She needed money to get her hair done, and there was a pair of shoes that she just had to have. Could he write her a check or maybe give her his bank card and pin? Dude, I hope he didn't do that. It was during this time when he needed her support more than ever that Chris finally saw the dark soul of the woman he had fallen in love with. Even so, Chris would probably still have accommodated Patricia's constant lust for cash. The problem was that the money wells had dried up. As a one-man operation, he only earned when he was out there doing his thing. Right now, he was flat on his back and unable to work. Not only that, but his hospital stay was costing him a lot of money, more than was covered by his health insurance. For the first time in the 12 months that they had been together, he told Patricia no. Her response was to storm out of the hospital, expletives in her wake, never to return. What? Recovering from a stroke is no small thing. But Chris Shufflin was as tough as they come. He was out of the hospital in record time and back to work long before doctors had recommended. He also moved on from Patricia and started dating a secretary named Judy Wynn, who was 10 years his senior. Judy was the polar opposite of his former lover. She was caring and refined and financially independent. Her interest was in Chris, not in his wallet. While Chris was moving on with his life, Patricia had returned to her old stomping grounds. She was working the bars again, flirting, caging drinks, trying to land her next meal ticket. But she had been out of circulation for a while, and most of her regular marks had either moved on or were wise to her scheme. Her fading looks also meant that she had barely any luck with strangers. Eventually, she was left with only two options. It was either back to her waitressing gig or back to Chris. Unsurprisingly, she decided on the latter. An arrogant woman by nature, she was convinced that Chris would come running the moment she crooked her finger. Hmm, I don't think he is. Unfortunately for Patricia, Chris had no interest in rekindling their romance. He told her that he was in a happy, committed relationship and asked her never to call him again. Then he hung up on her. Hmm, that probably didn't go over well. That stung, but what really hurt Patricia was what she found out about Chris's new girlfriend. Judy was 59 years old, 21 years older than she was. Wow. Yeah, that had to hurt, I'm guessing. Had she really become so unattractive that she could lose out to a woman who was old enough to be her mother? A look in the mirror provided scant reassurance. Patricia's hard-drinking, hard-partying lifestyle had taken a toll. Her skin was sallow, her hair limp. There were wrinkles around her mouth, dark circles under her eyes. It is typical of Patricia Tito's personality that her first thought was that Chris had left her because of her looks. Did not even enter her thinking that it was perhaps because she had walked out on him when he had needed her most. Still, Patricia was a determined woman. She believed that she could win Chris back and started inundating him with phone calls. When that didn't work, she switched tactics and started leaving threatening messages on Chris's answering machine. Given what was to come, these make scary listening. You just better sleep with one motherfucking eye open, one message said. Let me tell you something, partner. When I get a hold of Judy Wynn, ain't nobody on God's green earth going to be able to make her fucking recognizable. Another message went. You have no idea what I'm going to do to the both of you, yet another said, you'll never fucking see me coming, do you hear me? Chris Shufflin and Judy Wynn should probably have taken these threats seriously, should probably have reported them to the police. Sadly, they did not. I can't imagine what I would do if I got phone messages like that. It would be frightening for sure. 
On the evening of August 31st, 2003, Judy Wynn hosted a dinner at her southeast Shreveport townhouse for Chris Shufflin and members of her family. Later, after her guests had left and while Chris was in the bathroom, she was standing at the kitchen sink washing the dishes. She was so engrossed in her work that she did not even see Patricia Tito crossing the lawn towards her. When she looked up, Patricia was just feet away, standing on the patio, pointing a gun at her. Before Judy even had time to react, Patricia pulled the trigger, firing a single shot that passed through the open window and hit Judy in the chest. By the time Chris reached his badly injured girlfriend just moments later, Judy was lying on the kitchen floor, blood rapidly turning the front of her dress crimson. Trisha Tito shot me was all she managed to say before losing consciousness. Chris ran to the phone and dialed 911, bringing paramedics rushing to the scene. But it was already too late. For all of Chris's exhortations for her to hold on, Judy was just too badly injured. The bullet had chewed through vital organs and blood vessels, leaving carnage in its wake, causing irreparable damage. Judy never stood a chance. Very little investigative work was needed to bring Patricia Tito to justice, not when the victim had named her as the shooter. She was arrested that same day and charged with first-degree murder. Facing the possibility of life without parole, she decided to cop a plea to the lesser charge of manslaughter, The sentence of the court was 40 years in prison with a stringent non-parole period of 38 years. Patricia Tito will be in her 70s by the time she is released from custody. Her days of trolling the bars for gullible men are well and truly over. Wow. Well, both of those stories, the women got what they deserved as far as when they, after they committed murder. I hope you guys all have a fantastic Friday and a good weekend and that you enjoyed these two true crime stories. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing and I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.